What can you do if someone you love is diagnosed with a disease so hopeless and so rare, drug companies won't develop a treatment because it would never turn a profit? You might try doing what Mark Dant did. His little boy Ryan was one of only 40 babies in the United States born each year with a fatal genetic condition called mucopolysaccharidosis or MPS1. Mark and his wife Jean were told they could do little more than wait for their boy to die. But the dance were not willing to accept that. Ryan's father embarked on a mission with only one goal, saving Ryan. When you hear the words the night before, what's it going to be like when I die? The next morning you go out and you say, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. And I'm a, I'm a police officer, but I will find something, somewhere, somebody will give me the answer to be able to tell you, Ryan, you know what? You're not going to die. Hi. Hi. Ryan was born in 1988, and from what his parents could see, was growing into a healthy, active toddler. Mark was on the police force, and Jean worked in the airline industry. Together, they were building a quiet, peaceful life in the suburbs of Dallas. That is, until 1991, when Ryan turned three, and a physician discovered his liver was abnormally large. What did he tell you? Ryan was very ill, and that he probably wouldn't live uh, beyond the age of 10. He told you that yes. that day? That he had a disease called MPS, or mucopolysaccharidosis. He said that uh, Ryan would uh, be probably blind, or deaf, or mentally handicapped, and uh, he would be in a lot of pain because his limbs would draw up, his hands would, would change, and he wouldn't be the same boy. Kids like Ryan with mucopolysaccharidosis 1 are missing an enzyme that the body needs to break down certain waste materials. Over time, the buildup damages organs like the heart, stiffens the joints, affects breathing, and stunts growth. In some cases, it can lead to severe brain damage and mental retardation. You must have asked them, treatment, cure, what can you do for our son? Yes. The answer was the same. They're just, there aren't that many children in the world with MPS. And because of that, there just is not much uh, going on in the world as far as research. If researchers wouldn't look for an answer, the dance decided they would. While Gene stayed home with Ryan, Mark tried to learn just what he was up against. He went to a conference in Denver where he met other parents and MPS children. Ryan was three when I left Dallas and went to Denver. And uh, he wasn't that affected by MPS. But when I got to Denver, I saw five and seven and 10 and 12 year olds. But I didn't see anyone after 12. Scary. Yes. Children who were dying and children who by the next year would be dead. And you couldn't see your son that way? I would lay in bed at night and worry about Ryan being that way. Mark became obsessed with finding a cure and started the Ryan Foundation to help fund one. If everybody on the sheet comes in, we're at 141. It became a community project with all their neighbors joining the fight. Their first fundraiser was a bake sale. How much did you raise? The day netted us $342. But it was a beginning. It's a first step. $342. With nowhere to spend it. With nowhere to spend it. And how much did you think you needed? I had no idea. I think, I think what we needed was one day. Whatever money you could raise in one day, somewhere, somebody could use it. Meanwhile, Ryan's health continued to decline. He began having headaches so excruciating he would vomit and pass out. His fingers started to curl. At age seven, Ryan's hands got too stiff to play his favorite sport, baseball. To keep him in the game, his father attached Velcro to his bat. Eventually, even that didn't work, and Ryan had to quit the team. On Saturday mornings, when everybody else was going to their baseball games and soccer games, uh, Ryan and Gene and I would go to a physical therapist. And on the way home, we wouldn't drive by the baseball fields. I would purposely take a long route. So you wouldn't see the other children out playing a game that he loved but couldn't play? And uh, on a selfish perspective, so I wouldn't see it either. Mark still worked full-time as both a cop and as Ryan's dad. 
Every day after walking the beat, he changed his uniform to walk another beat, knocking on doors and shaking hands, hey, nice to meet you. raising money to give to someone, How's it going? anyone, working on a cure. Over three years, the Ryan Foundation graduated from bake sales to $100,000 golf tournaments with Ryan as their poster child. Show you this? Yeah, it kind of shows Ryan's love for baseball. Every time I walked into a corporation or a company or a store, I would show them a picture of Ryan. I would say, I'm here not as a police officer, I'm here as a dad, and here, here's my cause. And I'd show them the picture. If I went to 100 places, 99 would still say no. But one would say yes. And then that was a big day. But his biggest day came in 1995 when Mark met a young scientist at UCLA named Emil Kakis. Dr. Kakis was one of the few researchers in the world studying MPS-1, and his meeting with Mark Dant couldn't have come at a better time. You're almost ready to shut down? The research was stalled, and I, I still held out hope that we might be able to find some angel investor to come in and give us money and make it happen, but it was... Uh, very frustrating to feel that you had something that would be beneficial for a disease that wasn't currently treated and couldn't do anything about it. So this is the lab where you actually do the research on the enzyme? Dr. Kakis had a sense that this complicated disease had a fairly simple solution. Create a synthetic version of the enzyme that's missing in kids who have MPS-1. This is what a normal healthy human body does naturally? Yes, normally your body makes these enzymes all by itself. They're helping everything run because your body is constantly building itself and breaking itself down. And one of those enzymes that's involved in that process is missing in MPS-1 kids. So by making it, we can help substitute for what they can't do themselves. The science was solid, but to take his synthetic enzyme from the lab to the bedside, Dr. Kakis needed money. And Mark Dant promised to provide it because he knew that time was running out for his son, who by the age of seven found even the simple act of breathing unbelievably difficult. I'm getting paged again. As Ryan fought for his life, Mark fought for money, eventually raising a total of a million dollars. He gave all of it to Emil Kakis. They basically decided to take all their money, you know, put all their chips on one number, which was us, and hoped that their number would come up, and uh, fortunately it did. Dr. Kakas attracted additional funding from a small biotech firm and had gotten FDA approval for a clinical trial of his synthetic enzyme treatment. Ten kids were chosen for the trial at Harbor UCLA Hospital in California. Ryan Dant was one of them. Well, guys, I think it's time to head towards the gate. In February of 1998, Ryan's neighbors gathered at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport for a big send-off. When I was at the airport, when I was about to get on the plane, everybody made um, uh, art, and I went through it and went on to the plane. All the years of knocking on doors and holding bake sales had paid off, and as they boarded the plane, the dance finally had something to hope for. At the hospital, there remained the reality of a sick little boy. I need a wheelchair, Mom. He spoke at the time about what he was getting ready to go through. I'm a little bit scared. He was tired of needles and doctors and feeling weaker and weaker every day. When's this gonna end? I just wanna go home because I don't like it here. I don't like to do all these tests. What's going to happen, that enzyme's going to circulate in your blood, in your body, going all over your body, and get to where it's needed to start breaking down the material that's there. Two months before Ryan's 10th birthday, Dr. Kakis and the dance administered the first dose of Ryan's enzyme treatment. Okay, ready? I'll bet $10 in one week you're going to feel better. Yeah. Ryan wouldn't take the bet, but it was a bet Dr. Kakis won, and he wasn't the only winner. Week by week, drip by drip, Ryan's life improved. Here we go. One, two. Yay! 
And here he is today, at age 13, back in the game. A day his parents thought they might never see. Hey, that was a pretty good hit. Thanks. <laughs> before you started getting your treatment, could you hit like that? No. <gasps> what were you like before? I couldn't hit the ball a lot. I couldn't actually run that fast. So you didn't have much energy? I couldn't bend my arms back. And you used to have headaches, your father told me. Terrible. How bad were they? Really bad. As bad as you can think. But the emotional pain often was worse. I was just getting scared coming up to that 10 years. So you actually knew there was a possibility before that you might die when you were 10? Yeah. Any thought about that? You worried about it? What would you say to your, to your parents? It's going to be okay. And now that you're on the treatment, what's happened to all those symptoms? Feels like I can do everything that I ever wanted to. Like, go ride my bike every day. Or play baseball, basketball. You name it, I can do it. Except rock climbing. <laughs> Which you probably shouldn't do anyway, yeah. right? And Ryan wasn't the only one from the FDA trial to get better. All ten kids showed improvement. I'm out. Results so impressive, they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Three years after that first trial, Ryan still receives the enzyme treatment once a week at a Dallas hospital. And with him is this boy, Spencer Holland, whose own family is facing a crisis similar to the dance, only three times worse. On the counter. Amy and Steve Holland have three kids, and all three suffer from MPS-1. When the clinical trial started, the Hollands were told only one of their children could get the drug. They were asked to choose which one. How do you make that decision? How could any parent make that decision for their child? So they left the decision to the doctors who chose the oldest, Spencer. Geronimo! Like Ryan, he has improved tremendously, but for the Hollands, it's been a mixed blessing. We saw Spencer getting better and better and stronger and more and more like a normal, healthy child. Meanwhile, our little girls were getting sicker and sicker and weakening. It seemed like every minute that ticked by, we knew that there was a drug available to help our children, yet we couldn't get it to them. At that point, the drug still had not been approved for general use, and it still hasn't. The FDA is requiring a second clinical trial with a larger sample, one with 42 kids worldwide. What did you think when that happened? That must have been bittersweet well, for you. When we heard about the second clinical trial, of course we submitted both of our girls' names, but we never thought that both of our girls would be chosen to participate. So every day we waited for news to hear whether or not they would be chosen. Both girls were chosen, and just in time. Lainey and Maddie Holland had been deteriorating quickly. Lainey had to have brain surgery, and Maddie was losing her ability to walk. Very load up. Recently, the entire Holland family had to pull up roots and move from Texas to North Carolina for the experimental treatment. At this point, we would be willing to fly to the moon and back once a week, I think. Just to get just this to treatment. Get this drug. Although the Dance and the Hollands consider this treatment nothing less than a miracle, it is a miracle with limits. It hasn't reversed all of the damage in Ryan's hands, and doctors suspect the enzyme is not reaching the brain. That means it probably will not stop the mental deterioration typical of MPS-1 victims. But thanks to the work of one visionary doctor and one determined family, these children now have something precious, time. Time to await a cure and plan for a future that many thought would never come. If you ask Ryan when he was little what he was going to be when he grows up, he would always say a baseball player. And for a while there, he stopped saying that. Now he says it again. He still believes he's going to be a baseball player. He's got dreams again. Right. And so do we. I think Ryan has the same potential that he had when he was laying as an infant in the nursery. He has the potential to be a great person. Back when he was, when he was perfect. Yes. And he still is.